directors of the Tales of Cape Cod, it is my privilege to welcome you to tonight's program and to introduce our guest speaker. Please pick up a copy of our 2017 speaker series at the desk to plan the rest of your summer entertainment. It is also available on our website, www.talesofcapecod.org. How many of you are first-time attendees? Welcome. For those of you who are not familiar with Tales of Cape Cod, here is who we are and what we do. Tales of Cape Cod Incorporated is a nonprofit organization dedicated to preserving and communicating the history of Cape Cod. And maintain this old colonial courthouse built in 1763. Might not feel like a courthouse as you sit there in those pews. That's because it was transmogrified into a Baptist church in the 19th century. We also preserve the Iana gravesite property in Cumaquid. Our speaker series has been operating since 1949. We also conduct reenactments and dramatizations of events that occurred in and around this colonial courthouse. Our sponsors for, ten for tonight's presentation are Bill and Tony Cook. Are they here? Oh, too bad. Okay. Well, they picked a great one because tonight's speaker is Mary Malloy. Dr. Malloy teaches museum studies at the Harvard Extension School. It might be for her, I don't know. <laughs> and for 25 years, she was professor of maritime history at the Sea Education Association in Woods Hole. She is the author of a number of books, including Devil on the Deep Blue Sea, about Captain Sam Hill, an incredible sailor, but apparently not a nice man. Please save your questions for our speaker until after the presentation, and then join us in the conference room for marvelous desserts, for which many thanks to Jude Martin. If you have any comments about tonight's presentation or ideas for future presentations, please use the comment card in your seat pocket and drop it in the basket in the dessert room. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mary Malloy. Thank you, Greg, and thank you all for coming. I'm uh, very happy to see such a nice crowd. Um, I'm going to speak tonight about a man that I met first in a journal of a voyage, and his name is Sam Hill, and I know that the first question is, um, what the Sam Hill is this all about? Anyway, um, he is not the person uh, for whom that cockney rhyming slang thing comes, but as I say in my book, even though he wasn't named after the devil, he grew into the name. Um, and in fact, in his life, he was really uh, quite a horrible guy. So I first met him uh, when I was out on the northwest coast on one of uh, sea semester's ships. I, I was writing a dissertation about uh, Boston men um, traveling to the northwest coast. A lot of Cape Codders actually on those ships as well. This was the first leg in America's China trade. And I'm just going to, in, in 20 seconds, say that prior to the American Revolution, um, there were no ships from the American colony making the voyage to China. Uh, that the, the English held very tight control over the China trade, first through something that were called the Navigation Acts, which were laws uh, about where people could go to, but also because a couple of monopolies held control over the China trade, and the people in the American colonies were not part of those monopolies. After the China trade, there was a real enthusiasm, I mean, after the American Revolution, there was a real enthusiasm um, among Bostonians especially, to get going uh, to China. And the problem then was, what do you bring to trade to the Chinese for some of the most expensive uh, products on the planet? So tea and silks and porcelain, when the things that Bostonians had to trade were salt codfish and lumber, those were the main things. So you can imagine um, that that's not a very good balance of exchange. But on his third voyage to the Pacific, Captain James Cook had made a stop on the northwest coast and while his men were there, they were thinking about traveling up into the high Arctic. Uh, Cook's third voyage, the job was to see if they could find a way from the Pacific into the Atlantic over the top of the North American continent. So they had stopped at this place at Vancouver Island, and while they were there at a place called Nootka Sound, his men traded with the local Indians uh, for furs that they could wear, that they could sleep on um, while they were traveling up into the Arctic waters, 
And later they took those furs, sea otter pelts, and in China they traded them and got this tremendous um, economic boost from them. So the Bostonians that were thinking about getting started in the China trade right away decided that what they would do first is head out to the northwest coast and collect the sea otter pelts there that were loved by the Chinese and bring those to Canton. And that was what underpinned uh, the first Boston voyages to Canton. So um, I was interested in the northwest coast. I'm from the northwest originally. And so um, I wrote my dissertation. I was working then at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem. And they had all these great things that had been collected on the northwest coast. So my question was, what were these New Englanders doing there at this early time? And so um, I had a chance to go. This is actually at um, a place called uh, an instance in the Queen Charlotte Islands, or Haida Gwaii, a place where Haida Indian people live. And this is one of the last places where you can still see uh, totem poles in their original location. And there I had been reading about this guy, John Jewett. John Jewett was captured in um, 1803 at this very location. He was on a ship called the Boston, and you can imagine where it was from. And he was the blacksmith on board, and he was captured, and he was held in captivity uh, for about two and a half years. And then he was rescued, and he was rescued by this vessel called the Lydia, and it had a captain, Sam Hill. And John Jewett wrote a narrative about his captivity, and it was a standard kind of a story to be told at that time. It was first published in um, 1806, and that was when there were a lot of captivity narratives that were being published of people who were captive of Indians um, in various places around the country. So um, John Jewett wrote this thing, and then at the end of the book, it's like, and then I was rescued. <clears throat> and there's no more, really, about the rest of it. I found, while in the process of, of looking at all of the surviving uh, log books and journals of Northwest Coast Trade, a journal kept by a guy named William Walker, who was on the Lydia, and he described this beast of a captain. And then I found two more journals. This guy, Sam Hill, actually had a Hawaiian girl who they estimated was about 15 years old that he had captured in Hawaii and essentially uh, kept her as his sex slave uh, through the whole of this voyage around the North Pacific. So he kept her on board for about two and a half years before he brought her back to Hawaii. He was a guy that used to go down into the forecastle with a club and beat on guys. I mean, he was horrible. So another guy that kept a journal named Isaac Hurd had been assigned to be the manager of the business part of it. And he and Hill um, could never get along. And so finally, at one point on the Northwest Coast, Isaac Hurd decided to leave the ship and go to another vessel from Boston that was on the <coughs> Northwest Coast and come home. But he wrote terrible stuff about um, Sam Hill. And Sam Hill knew that Isaac Hurd was heading home to write terrible stuff about him um, and to tell people about what a bad guy he was and a bad captain. So I think that probably it was part of Hill's strategy to rescue John Jewett. They knew, everybody had known for a couple of years, that there were survivors of this capture and massacre of the ship Boston. And so he decided he was going to go and rescue him, and he did. And so my first thought was, I'm going to write a book about John Jewett that's essentially going to have his first captivity among the Indians and the Indian chief, Maquina, at... Um, Nootka Sound, and then the second part of the book was going to be his captivity under Captain Samuel Hill on board a ship. And so I thought this was a great idea. But Sam Hill took over the project. Oh my God, what the Sam Hill? He actually did sort of steal my life for about 10 years while I became obsessed about everything that had happened to him. And I have to say, when my mother-in-law first read this book, she said, why would you write such a terrible book? And then she said, oh, I mean, why would you write about such a terrible guy? But he is a really interesting guy. So here's where the, um, here's where, here's the Kassound, where um, John Jewett was held captive. And one of the interesting things about this is that um, Sam Hill not only rescues John Jewett, but then he goes down uh, to the Columbia River, the next place, and on board he has this Hawaiian woman who he's actually um, sort of not paying much attention to at that time because he has now adopted another lover um, a class up Indian woman in the Columbia River, and he's off um, in the small boats all the time. While he is there, unbeknownst to him, Lewis and Clark arrive in the Columbia River. And Lewis and Clark are asking the Indians, have you seen any American ships? Because in fact, one of their instructions from Thomas Jefferson was, 
When you get out to the Columbia River, see if you can find one of the American ships that are out there, because there were a lot of ships involved in this trade, and send your journals back with them. But the Indians, it clearly was no advantage to them for these two groups to meet up with each other. So even though they were both in the Columbia River, they did not meet each other. But they heard so much about Captain Hill that they actually named a bay after him. Oops. Um, that was uh, right in here. This was called Hill Bay or Haley Bay. And they also collected some hats from the Indians there that can only have been conveyed to the Columbia River on Hill's vessel because these are, are um, vessels that were, these are hats that are specific to Nootka Sound and there was no indigenous trade that would have brought them there. So they had to have been brought on, on um, Hill's ship. More about them in a moment. Here is um, Captain Clark uh, writing in his journal, um, which, by the way, if you haven't read it, it's one of the great documents of American history. The Lewis and Clark journals are a ripping good read. I highly recommend them. Um, <laughs> He says, we overtook two canoes of Indians going down to trade. One of the Indians spoke a few words of English and said that the principal man who traded with them was Mr. Haley and that he had a woman in his canoe who Mr. Haley was fond of and etc. He showed us a bow of iron and several other things which he said Mr. Haley had given him. So this is Sam Hill um, in the Columbia River. And uh, John Jewett writes in his journal, uh, we proceeded about 10 miles up the river to a small Indian village where we heard from the inhabitants that Captains Clark and Lewis, this was before he knew they were actually supposed to be called Lewis and Clark, uh, that Captains <laughs> Clark and Lewis from the United States of America had been there about a fortnight before on their journey overland and had left several medals with them, which they showed us. This is one of the famous peace medals um, with the shaking hands that Lewis and Clark were distributing among the Indians. They also each wrote in their journal similar entries about collecting these special hats. Um, so this is... Um, and you can see in both of them, the thing that, that distinguishes them is this knob at the top. And they also talk about that they um, have, they contain um, blah, 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 figures without a brim, um, chasing, oh, there's something here that actually says whales, but I can't find it right now, but believe me, it does. And here they are, chasing whales. These two hats actually survive from the Lewis and Clark expedition. This is a really astonishing thing. Um, they must have taken extraordinary care of them because they're made, uh, they're woven basketry. But when they came back to Washington, uh, they gave one to Thomas Jefferson and one to um, a Philadelphia um, a museum keeper whose name was, oh, I can't believe I can't remember his name, Peel. Um, so Charles Peel ran a, a museum in Philadelphia and the hat from Thomas Jefferson eventually went to Peel's museum as well. Peel's museum went out of business the stuff came to a museum in Boston. When it went out of business, they gave it to Harvard. So these things are at Harvard, but they survived from the Lewis and Clark um, expedition, but they were brought to the Columbia River on board Captain Hill's ship, the Lydia. There's no other way for them to have gotten there because uh, Nootka Sound had been closed to all trade during the time that, um, that John Jewett was a captive there. These are, in fact, um, images of guys at Nootka Sound. This is McQuinna. Um, who was in fact the captor of John Jewett, and this is a um, John Weber who was on Cook's uh, third voyage made that image. So here is this really interesting thing about this guy, uh, Captain Hill. Um, there were also a lot of things at the mouth of the Columbia River which had clearly been introduced by Americans and a couple of other things that I think also were transported to the Columbia by Hill. Here is a hat that, as Clark said, was made in the fashion which was common in the United States two years ago. So it's a top hat made by Haida Indians out of basketry. And another one that was made in the shape of a, probably a Russian sailor hat, uh, which Lewis says that um, among other things that they saw there, they had sailor jackets, overalls, shirts and hats, independent of their usual dress, and a considerable quantity of sailors' clothes as hats, coats, trousers and shirts. So there had already been a lot of trade with the Indians at the mouth of the Columbia River. Unfortunately, um, they never met up and consequently Hill did not receive the, um, the journals of Lewis and Clark to take back, but at one point when they were ashore, they did receive a letter which Lewis and Clark had left with the local Indians to be sent back when possible. So um, this is William Walker who kept that journal in which I first discovered the horrendous treatment of sailors by Captain Hill. 
At 4 p.m., the skipper and his lady went on shore to pay the chief a visit. The natives returned a paper on board that Captain Clark had left with them, declaring them citizens of America. They tell us he left them in April. He says the natives here have treated him very civil on his travels um, through. And so um, now Hill, on his way to China, had in his possession this document that Lewis and Clark had left at the Columbia River. And so he proceeded on to Canton and put that letter on a ship that was bound to Philadelphia. And that letter arrived back in Philadelphia before the Lewis and Clark expedition arrived back in Washington. So people had known that they had reached the Pacific, which is an interesting thing. Okay, so who is Sam Hill and why is he interesting? Um, he was a young man that went to sea early. And the other thing too is I already suspected having read Jewett and then re reading these um, log books by Walker and Isaac Hurd, that Sam Hill was a uh, beast. Um, but it turns out he's also a liar. And in fact, he's such a liar. Oh my God, this is something too that I frequently tell my students. You know, there's a, a perception that you read these old documents and there you find the truth of the past, except when the person writing the document is a liar. Um, and so you really have to be careful that in fact what you're, what you're looking at, you know, you're being careful about. So um, uh, at one point in his life, um, Sam Hill had a sort of religious experience um, and wrote a little, a little, what he called his autobiography, how his life was gonna change at this point and he wasn't gonna be such a uh, terrible sinner. And um, so he described his early life, he said, um, my father was a much respected and ever honored and honest man. He actually underlies honest man. Um, and that he died uh, when he was eight years old. Interestingly enough, there were two big massive log books of Sam Hill's own voyages that survived. And they were given to the New York Public Library by his grandson, a guy named Stanhope Hill. And Stanhope Hill actually started the Mass Maritime Academy, which used to be in the um, State House. So he started the first um, navigation school run by the state of Massachusetts. And he wrote a note about Sam Hill's relationship with his father. And he said that um, when he was about 13 years old, he had received a savage beating from his father, a good old fashioned flogging, he calls it, after which he was locked in a barn for a day. So amazing that this could happen at 13 when his father died when he was eight, according to um, Sam Hill. And then um, his grandson goes on to write, Samuel took the punishment in both kinds quietly, but that night he packed up a bundle of clothes and telling his younger brother that he would never give his father an opportunity to whip him again, he stole out of the house to which he never returned and making his way on foot to the nearest seaport, he shipped as a boy on a brig bound to the West Indies and commenced his life career as a sailor. Um, so he was born in 1777. He went on this first voyage to the West Indies um, when he was about 13 years old. And then he made several voyages, which you can see here, and I'm not gonna go into the details of all of them, but let me just say that he was a real lazy bum. Um, so he was a guy that never moved up from being a common sailor. I mean, he, he would become an you know, able-bodied seaman, but he never worked to become um, an officer. So he made like seven voyages before he thought, eh, you know, maybe if this is gonna be my career, I ought to move up a little bit. But even when he became a mate, um, there were times when he traveled um, to Spain and other places. This is actually just to show he made a lot of voyages. He made this voyage to Cadiz um, on the coast of Spain. And while he was there, he hired another guy uh, to be the first mate. He was then the first mate while the ship was in port. It's the first mate's job to handle the unloading and loading of cargo. But he wanted to be with the local women who he said were such great guitar players. He just loved them. He couldn't resist <laughs> being with them instead of working on the ship. And so um, Sam Hill spends his time in port. And so it takes a long time before he moves up um, the ladder to become a, um, an officer. He made a voyage that I think is one of the most important um, in 1804. And I'm sorry, this is, um, so he, he made a couple of voyages around the Cape of Good Hope, um, first on uh, a ship that went uh, to Jakarta, um, then called Batavia, which was a Dutch port. And in 17, so I'm sorry, this is getting a little bit confusing because he made multiple voyages that went there. But at one point he was there in 1799. And at that point, the Dutch were at war in the Netherlands and they were having a hard time getting their, um, their annual ship that they sent to China. The Chinese had actually adopted a rule of um, isolation 
in the 17th century, and they only allowed a couple of ships in every year. Um, the Portuguese had been there. They got ejected by the... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the Portuguese were there first, and they were ejected by um, the Chinese uh, because of the religion. And the Japanese followed the Portuguese in. I'm sorry, the Dutch followed the Portuguese in and went to the same um, port that they had built at a place called Deshma, and they were required to stay there um, while they were trading. The Dutch sent one ship every year to Deshma in Japan from Batavia, um, Jakarta. When Sam Hill was on a ship called the Franklin, they arrived in Batavia and the Dutch East India Company could not get a ship from Holland that year. And so they hired this American ship because the Americans were neutral in the various wars that were going on in Europe. They hired this ship to um, make their annual voyage to um, Deshma in Japan from Batavia. Sam Hill was then a teenager. He's working on this ship. He befriends a young man from the Dutch East India Company who gets on board the ship in Batavia. And when they get to Japan, this young man named Henrik Doof invites Sam Hill to live with him in the compound, the Dutch compound, on Deshima while the rest of the sailors stay on the ship. And he's also invited to go with Doof into town off the island of Deshima. I think this makes Sam Hill the first American who ever lived on Japanese soil. Um, even though it was a short period of time, this was when the Americans were not making voyages uh, to Japan. But Sam Hill was there, and this ship, the Franklin from uh, Salem, uh, was actually painted while it was in Japan by a Japanese artist. And then um, there are some surviving Japanese illustrations of Hendrik Doof. This is actually the guy that became the friend of Sam Hill. Doof ended up staying in Japan. When they arrived there, it turned out that the guy that was running the place had recently died, and that he was now the most senior guy um, from the Dutch East India Company, even though he'd never been to Japan. So he becomes now the Dutch senior factor um, in Deshima, and he stays there for the next 16 years. So he had brought with him a servant uh, from Java, uh, Malayan, and um, while they were there, another American ship tried to come in, uh, the Grace of New York, and another Japanese artist did this illustration of the Franklin um, and the Grace in Deshima Harbor. But while they lived there on this island in, um, in Nagasaki Harbor, uh, there were these Dutch guys, uh, there were Malayans who were there working as their servants, uh, there were young women, Japanese women, who were essentially assigned um, as concubines uh, to stay in the um, place. And in fact, Hendrik Doof had two children uh, with one of the local women. Um, and they had uh, interesting stuff that gets illustrated in some of these. For the Japanese, um, slaughtering meat is something that's only done by people of a very low caste in the social system. And so the Dutch were ending up doing all that uh, for themselves. And you can see that in one of these prints. Um, and then this is another. These, these are actually watercolors. Um, a, a meal of the Dutch, the Japanese women, and again, the Malayan servants always, always in the background. So Sam Hill was here at a really interesting time. Um, again, this is the first American ship that travels to Japan. He's the first American that actually gets off and lives on shore. And the captain of that ship, William Devereux of Salem, brought some things back from Japan. These are the first objects that came back from Japan to the US. Again, happily for us, they survived. Uh, William Devereux was a member of the East India Marine Society of Salem, which is the group that founded what's now the Peabody Essex Museum. So these things went into their museum. Um, so Sam Hill, now, um, after he's made this voyage to Japan, he's made several transatlantic voyages, he finally decides he's going to knuckle down and become a captain. And the first ship on which he serves as a captain is the Lydia, the one that will um, uh, make all these problems um, on the northwest coast and eventually his, um, he will rescue uh, John Jewett in the process. By the way, I have to make here now a, um, a Cape Cod specific reference since he's actually not from Cape Cod. Um, there was a guy on board named Robert Kemp. Robert Kemp was from Wellfleet and Robert Kemp sadly died on the northwest coast killed by Indians with whom um, Sam Hill had had a fight after cheating them. So one of the things that Sam Hill did was he traded gunpowder in little kegs, and he would actually fill the bottom of the keg up with rope ends and then put the gunpowder on top of that. He added seawater to molasses uh, before trading it. Uh, so there were lots of things that he did that caused problems 
Um, and eventually poor Robert Kemp gets himself killed there on the northwest coast. Uh, but in all of this, um, Sam Hill is participating in what's going to become a really important business uh, for Massachusetts, including a lot of Cape Cod guys. And I just want to give a brief <coughs> sort of um, summary of the Pacific trade because I think it's a really important thing that most Americans are ignorant about. Uh, the fact is that uh, when whale ships first went around um, uh, Cape Horn in the 1790s and joined the China traders that were going out there, I would say that by 1820 to 30, there were more ships in the Pacific from Massachusetts than from all the countries in Europe combined. So that this was a place where Massachusetts was having a huge impact. So just to give you sort of a, a quick, uh, John Kendrick and the captain of the Lady Washington, that's my husband who's also my, um, my uh, prompter. Um, the um, captain of the Columbia was John Kendrick, the captain of the Washington was Robert Gray. And when they got to the Northwest Coast, they traded ships. And John Kendrick essentially at that point stole the Washington and never went home. Um, he went back and forth to China. He's the guy though that first discovered that he could bring sandalwood from the Hawaiian Islands to Canton and that that was going to be a pretty good product too. He died in a bizarre accident where it was his birthday. He was on his ship. He was in Honolulu Harbor. There was a British naval vessel there and he asked that they salute him with their cannons for his birthday. And you're actually not supposed to load the cannons when you're having a salute of that sort, but sadly, right through the cabin window and killed John Ledyard. Okay, so, um, so it became very quickly apparent that a stop in Hawaii would be good. Um, the other place that they're looking for is, so here's the Chinese goods. Uh, the principal one is tea, secondarily porcelain. Um, there are spices there, but most of the spices come from uh, the islands of Indonesia and they're dealing there with the uh, um, Dutch and others but they're bringing back every kind of spice you can imagine cinnamon, nutmeg, allspice um, so these are things that are valuable um, in that part of the world but in order to get there you need to stop along the way so that for most American ships the cargo that they carried out was not intended to go to China um, it was intended to go to a middle place where you would trade what you have for something else that was desirable to the Chinese so on the northwest coast, that was furs. In Hawaii, that was sandalwood. And so um, Hawaii was sandalwood, but there were other things in the South Pacific that they found too, including a mother of shell, torta, or mother of pearl, tortoise shell. <laughs> this guy, this um, handsome guy, is actually holding a uh, sea cucumber. And I'm sorry I couldn't find another. Um, it looks like a mass, a lumpy mass of slime, um, if it's just the sea cucumber itself. Um, Stuart and I actually ate them for the first time last year in China. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Looked like pineapple rings, but slimy. And um, yeah, all right. So, um, and then eventually, um, some of these things, there's a very interesting way that the trade works where, where the mother of pearl that came, especially from islands in the Tuamotos um, archipelago, which is north and to the um, east of Tahiti, uh, these mother of pearl shells, some of them went back to New England, were made into mother of pearl buttons. The mother of pearl buttons now became a product that went out to the northwest coast. And in fact, um, one of the things that canny traders saw, and one of the canniest, by the way, was William Sturgis from, from Barnstable, um, was that certain things would go right into the life of northwest coast Indians, and other things you sort of had to convince people that this was a good thing to trade for. Mother of pearl buttons and, and became adopted in northwest coast Indian culture to make these fabulous blankets that began to replace traditionally woven woolen blankets. And so this is entirely made out of trade goods. It's blue and red uh, blankets that are brought on trading vessels and appliqued with mother of pearl buttons. And so um, there is this change in the local cultures that's happening even as this trade is ongoing. Um, they brought the sandalwood and the tortoise shell to China where it was made into incense and fans and boxes and other things. And then in fact, there becomes a secondary trade from China back to the US in these things that are made out of the raw materials that they have brought on their own ships. Um, after that, um, they also went back and forth from China to the Northwest Coast. This mask, which I know Greg showed a couple of weeks ago, um, one of them was this very mask actually. William Sturgis held it up at a lecture that he gave in Boston um, and said, I, I want to introduce you to people of the Northwest Coast. But one of the interesting things about it is that the paint on her um, nose and on her lips is Chinese vermilion. So that paint has been brought to the Northwest Coast on board an American ship. Um, and then Sam Hill was in Chile trying to get 
copper ingots to bring to Canton. Um, and then the last thing I have on here is, oh, whale's teeth became a, an important product for trade. Um, the last one I thought I had was actually, well, that's not there, but uh, hides from the coast of California, which is another thing that William Sturgis became involved in, in these Pacific trades. So Americans are out there in the Pacific in big numbers. And so what Sam Hill is, is putting himself into is a trade that he is part of the establishment of it. But when he arrives on the Northwest Coast, for instance, that first time, there's bunches of Boston ships there. In fact, it became common when a ship came in to a village site on the Northwest Coast that a big canoe would come out and somebody would say in English, hello, um, you are the 14th ship to arrive here this month. What have you got? And frequently, what they had was not what the Indians wanted. And so, the Indians were being very choosy, which led guys like Hill to take captives among the um, chief um, guys in a village and hold them until he got pelts. And then he would just like dump stuff on them that he says was the um, value of the pelts. And off he sails away. And it became a common feature of this trade for another ship to come in not knowing what had happened send a boat ashore to get wood or fresh water, and the, the um, inhabitants of the boat would be attacked by the local Indians. And this happened over and over again. Again, it's something that William Sturgis described um, in a series of lectures he gave, which I happened to edit and uh, publish with the Sturgis Library down the street. So if you want to know more about it, you can read that. But, um, but this was a really interesting thing. William Sturgis said that most of those attacks that the perpetrator of the original incident was the Bostonians and not the Indians. And so he was a guy who was very sympathetic to that. Okay, so here is Sam Hill on his second voyage to the Northwest Coast. How did he get another job after that first job? That was one of my questions. He was such a creep and he treated people so badly and it wasn't even like the voyage was all that much of a success. But when he came back to Boston after having rescued Jewett, he wrote a number of articles that appeared in the local paper which made him into this really big hero. And then John Jewett's narrative was published and so there were people willing to hire him for a second voyage to the Northwest Coast um, on a brig called the Otter. And this is actually from a journal that was kept on that uh, by a guy named Ferguson. Did this amazing uh, map and chart uh, first of the whole voyage here and this is of this is the archipelago that was called the Queen Charlotte Islands, that he says here. Um, that was named after the ship of the first Englishman that was there. Uh, the Haida Indians um, got the Canadian government to officially change the name back to Haida Gwaii just a few years ago. Um, so now this is this archipelago um, of Haida Indians. But this is the coastline along which um, Sam Hill was traveling. And again, lots of problems with this, um, this voyage. Again, attacks and, and, and when he gets back to Boston again, um, in fact, he didn't get another job. And what happened for a time was that all international trade ceased uh, during an embargo uh, that was brought about by Congress that they were worried about the impressment of American sailors onto British naval ships, but also their impressment onto French naval ships. And so they thought the best way to just keep out of it was not to send any ships out at all. This is the moment at which all the signs that say Jefferson Street in Boston are taken down and replaced with Hamilton Street. Uh, Jefferson was the leader of the Republicans who mainly represented Southern agrarians, um, but Bostonians were Federalists. They were interested in global trade. And so this crackdown on global trade meant that guys like Sam Hill had to sit out um, that part of uh, what was leading up to the War of 1812. And he finally did get himself another job after the war and the, the job was to go to um, Valparaiso on the coast of Chile with 75,000 Spanish dollars and there to trade with what was hoped to be a new independent Chilean government um, who would have cast off the Spanish by the time he got there and then to take copper ingots um, via Hawaii onto Canton and then come home uh, by circumnavigating. So what is the thing that's going on here was that Americans on the coast of Chile were actually involved in the Chilean Civil War. There were a couple of guys um, that were fomenting revolutions against the uh, Spanish all over South America at this time. Uh, Simón de Bolívar um, and uh, José Martín. Um, and so a lot of these governments were, were taking over. And so <clears throat> the expectation for Sam Hill was that this 
trip only worked if he could buy the copper in Valparaiso. Because to take 75,000 silver dollars to Canton, you could certainly buy tea and other goods, but you would get nothing like the return on your profits that you would get if you had brought some other tradable material. And so by this point, actually, sea otter pelts, most of the sea otters have been killed. Um, so they're looking for something else to exploit. So off goes Sam Hill. He convinces Thomas Handeside Perkins, who's one of the premier uh, Boston ship owners, uh, to send him on this voyage. And William Sturgis is, in fact, one of the guys that's involved in this uh, consortium. And Thomas Handeside Perkins Jr. is on the ship. And oh my God, he hates Hill. He just writes nothing but terrible things about Hill. And in fact, when Hill comes around Cape Horn, waiting to see that, Span that Spanish flag removed and the new independent Chilean flag flying in Valparaiso, uh, no, the Spanish have actually regained uh, Valparaiso and they are closed to trade. So he hangs out there for a couple of months, hoping something's going to happen. Nothing does. And eventually, sort of with his tail between his legs, if there's a better euphemism for being on a ship, off he goes to Canton um, with $75,000. And he engages with um, James Cushing, who is a member of the Handicide and Perkins and Cushing a Consortium of Boston Merchants, to take the $75,000 off his hands and give him um, tea and other Chinese goods in exchange. He comes back to Boston, it's like, oh my God, that was a terrible voice. Why would he be hired again? He's hired again because Israel Thorndike doesn't like Thomas Handeside Perkins. And so Israel Thorndike is another ship owner, and he thinks that that gambit of going to Valparaiso can work. Eventually the Spanish are gonna be gone, and the new government's gonna need some trade. But the other thing is, a book came out during the War of 1812 that was published during the period that, that um, Hill was at sea by David Porter, an American naval officer, and he's down there on the coast of Chile, and he says, these revolutionaries, they are ready, and they are going to get um, their independence, and we're going to help them. And in fact, there were a number of skirmishes down there where the ships were all built in the Boston area, which is interesting, that both the Spaniards, who had seized some American vessels, and the revolutionaries, who had purchased them from American traders, are both on Boston-built ships. And here are these battles in the Chilean uh, War for Independence. The other thing is that David Porter said that when he was in the Marquesas, uh, in the Central Pacific, that he found there that there were forests of sandalwood, and that if you could bring a couple of big sperm whale teeth, you could trade those with the locals, and for one big sperm whale teeth, they would go up into the mountains, they would cut down the sandalwood, they would transport it to your ship, and that you could bring that to Canton, and you could get a million dollars in trade. Uh, he actually used that term, a million dollars. So Israel Thorndike says, okay, Sam Hill's a beast, but he's been on this route before, and so he hires him to make another voyage and to um, explore the Galapagos um, sperm whale thing. Um, but one of the other things that... David Porter said was that there were sperm whale teeth that could be found lying in the shallow bays of the Galapagos Island, which of course turned out not to be so. So here comes Sam Hill. Gets to Valparaiso. Dang, it's not the independent government yet. It's still the Spanish. So um, he decides he's just going to see what happens in Canton, goes to Canton, comes back. Now he's trying to suss out the, the Chilean market, and he brings back samples of different kinds of silk and different kinds of porcelain. He lives there while the, the revolution is ongoing in Chile. He meets some of the principal guys involved in it. And during this whole time, he's um, listening to guitar music with beautiful women, and he's, um, he's you know, hanging around um, at home. His cargo is sitting there on his ship. But during this time, he actually went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth three times between Valparaiso and Canton, which is like one of the longest passages you can make anywhere um, across an ocean on Earth. And at the end of it, he comes back to Boston. He has been gone one week shy of five years. And he says to Israel Thorndike, the owner of the ship, oh, too bad, I actually didn't make any money on the voyage. So he's had his ship for five years. He doesn't have any money. He does proceed to buy two houses on his own in the flat area below uh, Beacon Hill. So, of course, Israel Thorndike sues him, and that is pretty much the end of uh, Sam Hill's uh, career as a sailor. But an interesting thing had happened to him on that voyage, and that was that when he first got into, um, into China, 
He landed, there was a, an anchorage at a place called Wampoa. And then there was um, a, an island that was owned by the Portuguese that had been ceded to the Portuguese by the Chinese called Macau before you went up the Pearl River to Canton. And so while he was at Wampoa, an English minister named Robert Morrison asked if he could hitch a ride uh, from Wampoa up to Canton, and Hill said yes. And while Morrison was on the ship, he read these sermons, and he gave Hill a copy of the sermons that had been published. And that's the moment at which Hill says, okay, I'm going to change everything about my life. I, I've been a sinner. He doesn't quite say exactly what he's done, because um, I, it's almost as if he's, got, he, he's whitewashing everything. I have to tell you that when I was writing this book, um, I have a friend who's a psychiatrist, and I asked him to look at things that Hill had written, and things that people had written about Hill. And he said that Hill is a classic sociopath. And then he said something, which I've always loved, and that is that being a ship captain is actually a really good job for a sociopath. Because within this confined space of the ship, you can control pretty much everything about what's going on. So he's a guy that, that always sort of rewrote um, the story to make himself into the hero and seems to have convinced himself about that too. Um, and he wrote articles in the newspapers. He was a terrific writer, by the way, which is one of the things that made him interesting to, uh, to work with. Uh, but Morrison in, made him feel guilty and, um, and sorrowful, and so he wrote this autobiography. And one of the things he says is that he's going to go back home. He had married between voyages, and then between every voyage a child was born, so he had three children back in Boston. And so he went home to Boston with the expectation that he was going to go back to Maine, find the family home, become a farmer, and live there with his wife and kids. So while he was away, it turns out that um, he had left his wife at this place, the Abner Wheeler House, which actually survived until the 60s as a restaurant out on Route 9 um, in, I, I don't know if any of you know that, in Framingham. Um, she was living there, um, and he, in fact, when he gets home, it's like he's so exhausted and embarrassed that first he just has to hang out in the bars in the North End for about four days to recover his senses before he heads out to Framingham to find the wife and kids. And they're not there because they had uh, moved to a different place without telling him. So he has to seek them out and then, and then tells her, honey, um, I've decided we're moving to Maine and I'm going to be a farmer. They haven't lived together. Um, he's been at sea now uh, for almost 30 years. And in that time, they have lived together only for about four years of it. So she's not interested in that at all. And in fact, um, they never lived together again. And uh, the city directories from Boston sort of make it clear uh, that they're not living together. His children seem to hate him. One of his sons became a playwright. And even though he doesn't have any scandalous sea captain characters, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, sort of scenes in the Crusades with barbarians and, and other stuff. Um, it's a, an interesting thing. In fact, uh, his son um, wrote a play that John Wilkes Booth starred in on the stage. Uh, just another sort of strange little uh, part of his um, life story. Um, so the wife is no longer there, and he um, joins the Park Street Church um, in Boston. He buys a pew for the really expensive price of $600. Um, and he's buried, in fact, adjacent to there, uh, to the Park Street Church. Um, Boston is, is booming at this time, um, but Sam Hill is not going to be a part of it. Here is where he lies, actually in a uh, crypt not far from the uh, John Hancock Monument. Um, whether any of them is still there, I don't know. Okay, so, um, writing the book, you know, there were several things that I thought um, were important about Hill and important to share. One is that he is a part of this new... Pacific world. You know, for a long time, we've really taught maritime history as looking at um, what for many, the Atlantic world, you can actually get a PhD in Atlantic world studies at 20 universities, but for a long time that was called like the triangle trade, this idea that these lines went across the Atlantic, um, and they certainly did, but people thought of the Pacific as being so vast. Uh, that there were not those same kinds of connections. And in fact, if I had a globe, I could show you that if I hold up the globe and we're looking at the Americas and, um, on one side and Europe on the other, that the Atlantic is about this big. If I turn the globe around, the Pacific is all water. You don't see any land. You don't see any land edges. The Pacific is vast. Nonetheless, people from Massachusetts went out there in very large numbers. Just on whale ships alone in the 19th century, there were 12,000 voyages from New England ports um, to the Pacific. Uh, there were hundreds of these China trade voyages. 
The impact was really tremendous on resources. I mean, of these resources that they traded, sea otters um, were hunted to the verge of extinction. Um, sea, uh, tortoises uh, become extinct. Sandalwood, you can't find any sandalwood anymore in either Hawaii or the Marquesas. Um, so all of these things get exploited to the edge of extinction. Um, and, and I think that that's something that it's important for us to sort of um, realize and understand what the impact was of Americans on, on local people, on, um, on natural resources. Uh, the world changed, the Pacific, but we also need to acknowledge that the Pacific is a place that had all those lines going across it too, that there were these voyages that were connecting things and that it was largely Americans who were doing it. The other thing about Sam Hill is just the fact that he rescued John Jewett, which, you know, you might care about that, but most of you, I bet, had not heard of John Jewett before you came in here. But you heard of Lewis and Clark, and the fact that he was the guy um, in the Columbia River when Lewis and Clark were there is very interesting. And that he would also be the first American to live in Japan, I think, makes him a character worth noting. He had written these um, articles for the Columbian Sentinel, which were published in Boston. Again, beautifully written. When he died, there was just a one-line thing in the Columbian sentence, you know, dead. Sam Hill. It was almost like one of those, you know, you know that joke about the woman who, um, whose husband dies in Maine? This is one of those Maine jokes. And, and she, says, um, she says to the newspaper, I want an obituary. It says, you know, Sam Hill dead. And the guy says, you know, you can get six words for free. And she says, okay, Sam Hill dead, vote for sale. Um, actually, like, that, that was a bad thing to turn right at my dramatic Sam Hill moment. But, but he's a, he, he represents in so many ways uh, what was going on with Americans, you know, out there in the Pacific, and I think that is something that is worth um, acknowledging. So, um, I have to say too that while he was a, a really bad guy, um, I have like the bad captain, good captain uh, combo, and that is William Sturgis. Oops, what happened to William Sturgis? Oh, I know what happened. Sorry. I'll just tell you. We don't need to see that. Um, William Sturgis was a guy that really was a sort of morally righteous, thought about these things, uh, concerned about local and native, native people. Um, his uh, lectures that he gave, I prepared for publication um, at the Sturgis Library, and you can buy that book there if you want to. Um, there's a third book I did that you might be interested in called Souvenirs of the Fur Trade, which is about the Northwest Coast Indian artifacts that were collected by American sailors in the course of this trade and brought back to American museums. And then beyond that, I just want to end by saying thank you all for coming out on a beautiful summer night. Um, and if there are questions... Can we take a couple of